Hello, everyone. This is Circuit Python Weekly for Monday, October 30th, 2023, one day before Halloween. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things Circuit Python. I'm Liz, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python. Circuit Python is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Circuit Python development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, consider purchasing hardware at adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafruit.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPython NISA's Discord role. There is a notes document to accompany the meeting and recording. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pins messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. First part is community news. This will look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a chosen set of items from our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. Second part is state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates. Third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to, take a couple of minutes and talk about what we've been doing in the last week, since the last meeting, and what you'll be up to over the next week. And the fifth part is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that covers how the meeting will go. And with that, we'll get started with community news. And big headline, CircuitPython 9.0 Alpha 2, an alpha release for 9.0 has been released. Version 9 adds significant capabilities over version 8. Adafruit blog and release notes are available. Notable changes, merge updates from MicroPython v1.19 all the way up to 1.21, expressive update to IDF v5.1, uh, and a few other things noted there. Uh, personally, I can just say I've been running the 9.0 alpha on a matrix portal S3, and it's been going well. Uh, another headline, CircuitPython Blinka compatibility layer is now supporting Raspberry Pi 5. CircuitPython Blinka Python capability layer now supports Raspberry Pi 5. You can create CircuitPython programs for Raspberry Pi and other single board computers running Python. Raspberry Pi 5 support added uh, with the new compatible version of libgpio.d. Uh, I know Melissa also did some speed testing with that too. Uh, and then project of the week, a QR code menu printer a la Quart. I've seen it around, um, I haven't been sure how to pronounce it, is a portable combination scanner printer for converting QR code menus into physical copies and is running on CircuitPython. Very cool project if you haven't seen it around. That was by Guy DuPont. And then this and more is available in our weekly My Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out via email on Monday mornings. That was today. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. If you have any Python on hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included, please consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open PR on GitHub, uh, mention Anne underscore engineer on Twitter and hashtag CircuitPython, or email cpnews at adafruit.com with a link. And for folks on Mastodon, those are also applicable. And then that is community news. Uh, next up is the state of CircuitPython, libraries, and Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our status updates. We'll talk about the project overall, then separately discuss the core, libraries, and Blinka. First of all, for overall, we have 34 pull requests merged by 19 authors. There were six reviewers, uh, 84 closed issues by 11 people, and 21 opened by 18 people. And assigned Hacktoberfest label is zero issues, but I believe the entire 
um, project is Hacktoberfest um, uh, at Google. So uh, next for the core, uh, Scott, would you like to read the core? Sure, Thank let me you. just find my tab. Okay, so for the core, we had 25 pull requests merged from 13 different authors, lots of new folks. Um, lots of folks in general. Uh, some new names, uh, Danzu is new, Pedro Mencano, Mesano, uh, Snipai uh, are all relatively new names to me. Uh, we had three reviewers, Jeff, Dan, and myself. Um, and we and we have 19 open pull requests, uh, which is well below our 25 single page goal, I would say, so that's good. Um, but a lot of these are the same, so uh, as always, let's take a look at those if we can and try to get the older ones closed for sure. Um, Issues-wise, we had 74 closed issues by 6 people um, and 12 opened by 9 people, so that's what, 62 closed? Um, I know that the vast majority of those uh, are uh, due to Dan's going over the long-term issues, which is super awesome. Um, so thanks to Dan for that, and all of the people involved in the issues. Uh, we currently have 671 open issues, which is obviously down from the 700 plus that we had. Uh, thanks again, Dan. Uh, we have eight active milestones. This is how we triage and uh, prioritize the work that Adafruit funded folks work on. So uh, if you're not Adafruit funded and find something in long term, for example, feel free to do it. We're still happy to support, uh, support you doing that stuff. Uh, it just means that Adafruit folks may not do it anytime soon. Uh, so we have uh, 15 open issues on 8.2x, which is our current stable release. And we have 60 open issues on 9.0, uh, which are the things that we want to get fixed or looked at um, before the 9.0 stable release. And we have one, we now have a 9xx uh, open issue as well, which is stuff we can do once 9.0 is stable. Uh, so that's like sooner rather than later, but not before 9.0. And then we also have a 10.0 milestone with no issues. This is where any um, breaking changes tend to go right now, uh, because we're just in the like, don't forget to do this in 10 uh, mode. Uh, we have two issues not assigned to milestone that need to be triaged. Um, that was when these numbers are, that will have changed a little bit. But generally, we're keeping up with the issues and triaging them as they come in. And that's it for the core. Awesome. Thank you. And next, mm -hmm. we'll hear from Tim for the libraries. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Uh, for the CircPython libraries this week, uh, this covers all of the projects that are on GitHub under the name Adafruit underscore CircPython underscore. And then a, a library name will come after that. This is the Python layer of code that allows you to interact with various bits of hardware or provides helper uh, functionalities to make things easier to do, uh, typically higher level inside your code. Uh, across all of those libraries this week, we had seven pull requests merged uh, by five authors and five reviewers. Uh, for our authors, I don't think we have anybody who's brand new, but uh, maybe the less frequent folks, thanks to uh, Cedar Grove and, uh, and Vladek, as well as uh, to you, Liz. I've seen you've been getting involved in library development and reviewing, so that's uh, really cool. Thank you for that. Uh, in terms of reviewers, we had our five reviewers, um, relatively uh, usual folks, I think, that are uh, doing reviews this week. Um, of those merged pull requests, the seven that we had, they were pretty much all on the newer side. The oldest one was only 10 days old, and the newest ones uh, were a handful that were only one day old. That is uh, That leaves us, I should say, with 43 open pull requests now, uh, the oldest of which is 431 days, and the newest is just one day. Uh, there, let's see, the uh, the six, uh, excuse me, I should say there were six closed issues uh, in the past seven days by six people, with seven uh, new issues opened up by seven people. Um, we don't have issues assigned uh, Hacktoberfest, but all of the repositories are, so all issues and PRs do count for that. Um, that leaves us right now with 666 open issues, uh, right in time for Halloween. We have 19 of those are labeled good first issues, and you can find those 19 as well as uh, all the rest of the issues at circuitpython.org slash contributing. On that page, it will list out the open pull requests as well as issues across all of the libraries. There is a dropdown that you can use to filter 
those issues in particular uh, by different labels that are applied to them, including the good first issue label, uh, which is a great place to go. If you are looking to get involved in CircuitPython, you want to help contribute or test or things of that nature, um, that's a good place to get going with that, as well as joining us here on the Discord. Um, on uh, the PyPy side of the stats this week, we had uh, 168,124 PyPy downloads for all of those 316 libraries combined. Uh, the top 10 list is uh, here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look at it. Um, I think, to my eye, the ones that look uh, newer in the top 10 that I don't think we see there typically are the, um, uh, I think those are accelerometers, some kind of uh, drivers in there, so that's interesting to see. Um, there is also a list here in the notes of the libraries that were updated in the last seven days, uh, including uh, one in the community bundle, as well as a handful in the Adafruit bundle. So take a look at those in the notes doc if you'd like. And that's what we've got for libraries this week. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. And next we will hear about Blinka from Melissa. Hello. Let's see here. I lost my window. I uh, found it. Okay. Um, so uh, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And uh, this week we had uh, two pull requests merged by two authors, uh, myself, and I'm not sure how you pronounce it, spelled A N H M I U H V, uh, and then two reviewers. Uh, there are currently three open pull requests amongst all the repositories, and there were four closed issues by one person and two open by two people. And we um, we have seventy six open issues remaining. There were there were, were fifteen thousand seven hundred forty seven Pi PI downloads in the last week, eight thousand seven hundred ninety nine Pi wheels downloads in the last month, and we are now up to one hundred twenty five boards. And that's it. Excellent, thank you. And that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I will start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or are missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. So I will start, I'm gonna kick things off with a group hug and then I'll be reading for Cedar Grove. Uh, to Foamy Guy for digging into the CircUp dependency scheme for community bundle libraries that reference other community bundle libraries, and ADCC for continuing to apply exceptional insight into addressing a Mac OS Sonoma fix. And now we'll hear from Dan. Okay, uh, thanks for Maker Melissa, um, who helped um, out figure out what was wrong with some broken library builds. On Sunday and other broken builds. Um, thanks to Foamy Guy Tim for reviewing and releasing some updates I made to Circup on Sunday, which was great because Circup was broken uh, at that point. Uh, thanks to Jeff for some changes that he's working on to bring us closer closer to MicroPython, and he's working on these even while he's on vacation. He's doing it in his spare time, so thank you. Um, thanks to Deshi Poo for a quick fix for um, in for 900, there are some problems with module properties for keypad specifically, but it points out a general problem that we need to audit um, a bunch of things about module types, about native module types. And thanks to Scott for um, fixing some remaining issues with the MicroPython merge and adding the warnings module, which is gonna be really handy in the future. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Next, we'll hear from Deshipu. Uh, Deshipu, I don't think we heard you, um, but you had a group hug. Uh, so now I will read for DJ Devin, who's text only. Uh, Toddbot for expanding his QDI eyeball code to the Qualia RGB666 boards and displays. Retired Wizard for the shout out and helping get Toddbot's QDI code working on their hack tablet. Uh, to me for a beautiful Earth and Mars demo on the Qualia 4 inch round display posted on Mastodon and for expanding Matrix scoreboard with even more capabilities. Thank you. 
uh, Tanut for the Friday deep dive on features and changes coming on the horizon. Foamy Guy for a Saturday morning deep dive into Circup and web workflow. And C. Grover for all his work on the Chimes and MIDI libraries. And now we'll hear from ADCC. Thank you, Liz. Um, I'd like to send a big thanks out to Dan H. for always being available with helpful advice and information. Thanks again, buddy. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Liz. Um, uh, echoing the uh, the last one, uh, my first hugs for Dan as well, uh, for finding and pulling a specific old version of Nina firmware from a, a Pi portal, as well as another one uh, to Dan for looking into the issues that were, that were causing Circup to crash and submitting a fix uh, that fixes those and makes it more resilient to failed bundle downloads. A uh, hug report to uh, Vladek for submitting the uh, a PR in Circup to allow it to work uh, with the web workflow. So devices that don't uh, connect as USB storage can uh, use Circup with this new functionality, which is really cool. Uh, thanks to Scott for continuing the DisplayIO uh, evolution and splitting out the various different display types into separate modules. Um, thank you to maker Melissa for working on the, the Pi 5 support in Blinka. That's really cool to see. Um, and then uh, my last one is outside of CircuitPython land, but I wanted to just say thanks to Sneak and uh, John Hammond, who's a, a YouTuber. Who, uh, they put on a 24-hour Fetch the Flag event last Friday. It was the first time I participated in Capture the Flag event, and it was really fun. Uh, there were lots of interesting puzzles, and I learned uh, several nifty tips and tricks from solving the ones that I actually managed to do. Uh, and that's what I've got for now. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Katni. All right. First up, I have a hug to Paul Cutler for a lovely chat and some great ideas. To Dan for keeping me in mind with regards to some science updates. To you, Liz and Noah for a great and informative chat. To Melissa for some excellent regular chats and a group hug for everyone. Thank you. Uh, apologies if anyone heard some background noise. My cat just uh, demolished some stuff. Uh, next we'll hear from maker Melissa. Hello. Um, I wanted to give a hug to Dan for helping out with the, the uh, an issue causing library builds to fail. Uh, to Katni for some great chats. To Anne for a quick review of the CircuitPython boards and a group hug to everyone else. Excellent. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Michael Pakuska, who's text only. Uh, so I will read a uh, Dan for explaining an issue of GitHub builds connected to Python 3x being changed from 3.11 to 3.12, and to Jepler for adding support for REPL.py that I suggested some time ago during a meeting. I somehow missed that it got merged and learned only a few days ago from the Adafruit blog. And now we'll hear from Scott. Hello, uh, Liz, thanks for iterating with me on the new CircuitPython library APIs that you've been working on. Uh, hug to Dan uh, for a lot of things, but uh, first, uh, leading three MicroPython merge efforts, uh, going through all the long-term issues and fixing lots of stuff over the weekend. And last up, thanks to Dishipu for fixing the keypad property stuff that I missed. I'll have to figure out why I missed that. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for um, helping me out with the learning the CP uh, library API stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. And that was Staz updates. Next up is In the Weeds. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. That was <laughs> Hug Reports. Next up is status updates. I had scrolled down too far. Uh, so status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I will start and we'll go through the list alphabetically. When I call on you, take a couple minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to in the weeds. And with that, I will get started. Uh, so I've started working on a space clock project with the 720 by 720 round display, uh, the four inch one that's in the shop with the Qualia board. Uh, project's gonna display coordinated Mars time, MTC and Earth time in the time zone of your choice, but with an analog clock face. So you'll be able to switch between viewing Mars time and Earth time. Right now I'm in kind of the beginning phases of the project, researching how MTC is calculated, making sure the images look good on the display and figuring out how the math will be involved for having the clock hands move to uh, correct positions. Uh, and next I'll read for C. Grover. 
uh, after building a custom PCM 5101A I2S DAC breakout for stereo line output, I've been looking into how to use it to send your CV control voltage signals from SynthIO, such as LFO and ADSR envelope waveforms. The I2S DAC is DC coupled and is capable of outputting frequencies of well less than 1 Hz, including DC voltages from negative 3 to plus 3 volts. It's looking like a new SynthIO CV object will be needed expecting that the new object could be made to be compatible with traditional analog DAC and audio PWM IO outputs as well. That sounds very cool. And now we'll hear from Dan. Okay, hold on. Um, so I released CircuitPython 900 Alpha 2 uh, last Friday. That's the first alpha in 900 that has a real release. We know of some things that we want to fix right away, so we'll probably have an Alpha 3 really soon. As mentioned, I reviewed um, 600, all 600 of the long-term issues and closed about 50 of them and asked a few people about a few other ones. And so that cut down uh, the long-term issues by about 8% and refreshed my memory of all of those. Uh, it took like three hours or so to do that. Um, there were a lot of build problems over the weekend because uh, GitHub uh, continuous integration uh, started having Python 3.12 as the default version of Python. And there are enough incompatibilities that it caused a bunch of things to break. So uh, we pinned some things to 3.11. Um, uh, the uf2conv.py utility needs to be updated because it assumes something that um, is not true anymore in 3.12. And there's also some stuff about setup tools that's not true anymore in 3.12. And this caused a bunch of things to break. And Melissa and I fixed these. That worked out OK. Um, I also updated CircUp so it doesn't break so quickly when the uh, bundles are messed up. Uh, if the bundles are missing or something, CircUp used to just give up. And now it will, if you upgrade to the latest version of CircUp, it will try really hard to use something that it's already downloaded or download what it can. So go ahead and up, update CircUp. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. There were a whole bunch of connected bugs, which is like a, there were a cascade of things. And every time I went down one path, I found something else that was broken. So, but I think it's all okay for now. And we need to eventually make things work with Python 3.12 po properly. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. And thanks for all your work on all of that. Uh, next, we'll hear from Deshi Poo. Okay. I think I fixed the microphone. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, unfortunately, I gave up on the touch version of the keypad. I simply don't have the experience with C and with microcontrollers to, to pull that off. Sorry. Uh, I tried different things, but uh, it doesn't really work the way I was hoping. Maybe someone else can try it. But, uh, yeah. I'm still looking uh, into the speech module from the MicroPython on, on the microbit. Uh, that's basically from Commodore 64, and uh, it works on the micro bit, so there is no reason why it shouldn't work on Circuit Python. Uh, I just have to figure out how to connect it internally. I will probably just generate a, a, a buffer, and that you will fit into into Audio IO uh, without having it run in the background because that's that's uh, too complicated. Uh, yeah, and I had some successes. I, I uh, finally managed to add touchpad to, to my circuit Python keyboard. Uh, so I have a nice pointing device built in into it. And because Halloween is coming, I, I gave a puffy uh, body to, to one of my robots and to, with some bunny ears in there. So that, that was a fun uh, project as well. That's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And love to see your robots dressed up. 
Uh, so next I will read for DJ Devin. Uh, purchased two Quala is P32 S3 boards and four inch round RGB 666 displays. Modified Toddbot's QDI code to work within a couple hours. There are pros and cons to the 720 by 720 display. Bad thing is there's a lot of pixels to draw, so the performance ceiling for FPS is much lower than, say, the 2-inch RGB 666 display. The display itself has gorgeous image quality that looks perfect for CAN bus and automotive gauges with vector graphics. There are many new possibilities to be explored with the RGB 666 displays, but the sheer size of the larger displays will require performance concessions for most projects. Uh, and next we'll hear from ADCC. Thank you, Liz. All right. So I uh, got pulled back into the Mac OS Sonoma issue, but that's a good thing. We've had some new useful information uh, that uh, indicates that if the file system is larger than eight megabytes, uh, it works around the problem. So now the issue is um, trying to find a way to uh, fake up a greater than eight megabyte file system to satisfy Sonoma. Uh, along the way, uh, I found the root cause of a long-standing issue where CircuitPython was not able to mount on Android. Uh, turns out that uh, CircuitPython reports a fake MBR with a partition code that Android does not support. Simply changing that code allows Android to mount uh, CircuitPython, and that includes FAT12 file systems. Uh, before a poll, I'm uh, going to need to test this on a number of OSs to make sure that changing that code doesn't cause anyone else to break. And finally, I've had no progress on the uh, Bluetooth support for uh, Raspberry Pi Pico W this week. And that's it. Back to you. All right. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Foamy Guy. All right, uh, thank you. So uh, last week I did a lot of testing around various versions of Nina firmware. I also did for the first time uh, figure out how to build the Nina firmware. Uh, mostly I was trying to find a specific version that uh, can work with the Cleveland Art API, which is from a Learn Guide project uh, from a while ago for Pi Portals. Um, I believed there was one version that I had seen work, and so I was going through trying to find them. And uh, with Dan's help, uh, I did eventually narrow down which one it was. It was uh, potentially the one that came preloaded on the device, although I'm not uh, super certain of that. But we did eventually track one down and were able to get it to work um, with that other version. So uh, at some point, we'll try to figure out what the differences could be and if there is some way to update the newer versions to get them to work as well. Uh, while I was doing testing on that, uh, a different issue exposed itself uh, in the same project. Um, uh, an issue with the bitmap label was occurring where uh, sometimes it would crash because it was trying to blit uh, pixels inside of a bitmap to uh, some out of bounds ranges. Um, I think it's based on the specific font that's used and then like which position the characters appear in. It's uh, the, uh, there was one of these issues that popped up that I found a pretty easy fix for and submitted that, and that solved it uh, in some of the cases, but it turns out there must be some more of those cases caused by different uh, triggers because those crashes are still happening. Uh, I'm working uh, now. I have it running on my Pi Portal here, and I keep clicking it uh, every time it's done loading to try to find one that causes it to break uh, so that I can then go back into bitmap label and fix whatever the next um, out of bounds issue is inside there. Um, it'll be much easier once I have some text that actually causes it. So um, that's kind of where I'm at on the on the um, Cleveland art front. And then uh, the other stuff that I worked on uh, over the past weekend is digging into Circup a little bit. I wasn't super familiar with it, so I was trying to wrap my head around how uh, it works inside there and what the various components are within it to, to make it go. Um, I wanted to do some testing on the web workflow support, which was submitted in a PR, uh, and I did manage to get that working on uh, a couple of my devices. That's really cool. Uh, and then the other thing that I was um, wanting to learn about Circup for is to figure out a solution for um, library dependencies that are 
outside of PyPy. So uh, Circup right now handles dependencies automatically from requirements.txt, and it converts from the, the PyPy name to the Circup name uh, automatically. But if you have a dependency that is in a library bundle but not published to PyPy, um, we don't really have a specific place or way to do that today. So I've been looking for what's the, what's the easiest way, what's the best way for us to provide that functionality uh, for dependencies that are not in PyPy but are in a bundle. Um, and that's what I have been up to. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Katni. Hello. I have not been up to much CircuitPython stuff, but since I was last here, I have been building up and wiring up my office into a workshop recording studio. Um, I've been going nonstop and everything is really coming together. I'm super close to being ready to start documenting projects and builds and sharing content. I'm really excited about reaching this point. It was a lot of work, but it's been entirely worth it. And a bit of a sneak peek, one of the things I did was put acoustic panels on my door, which doesn't sound like a lot, but um, it turned into a pretty big ordeal. Um, sound carries really badly in this house, so um, it was definitely a necessity, uh, but it took two tries and I made a lot of notes on what I did and kept track of what worked and what didn't, and this is the first project that I'm going to document and share. And that's what I've got. Awesome, thank you. And good to hear from you, Katni. Uh, next, we'll hear from maker Melissa. Let's see. Uh, last week, I finished up writing the CircuitPython driver for the CST826 capacitive touch driver, uh, which is the capacitive touch chip on the 2.1 inch RAM display. Um, I did a speed comparison between the GPIO and GPIO0 on the Raspberry Pi 5 and wrote up a playground note about it. And I have a link to it in the documents. Um, I added a the 4-inch round display to the Qualia ESP32 S3 guide. I added a bunch of new boards to circuitpython.org. There was like 19 new boards for CircuitPython and three more for Blinka. Um, or maybe it was actually even four for Blinka. Uh, I added a... Uh, or I mean, I helped out with fixing an issue with causing that was causing library to fail uh, when building uh, because, as Dan had mentioned, uh, they had bumped up to 3.12 if you just specify Python 3 in the, um, in the GitHub Actions. Uh, this week, I'm, work I'm working on writing the Arduino driver for the CST26 uh, touchscreen, and then I'll probably do guide updates and continue to try to find some solutions for bookworm issues. And that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. And now we'll hear from Scott. Hello. Uh, I merged in the display I.O. split, so it will now, uh, and I also added a warnings module modeled after CPython's warnings. Uh, so if you do like import display I.O. dot display, it will print out a warning, um, which will give you a heads up um, that in the future, in 10.0, we'll be removing it. Uh, the warnings module allows you to turn that off, uh, which is why I added it. So uh, take a look at that. Um, and give me feedback if you think it's actually, well, it's not helpful now, in my opinion, because 8 is still out there and we can't, it doesn't have the split. Um, but let me know what you think about having those warnings and, and how hard it is to turn them off, that sort of thing. Um, in similar news, I added a friendly error for dot show. So this is nice and relevant because you can change it immediately. And it just tells you how to change it. Uh, it tells you to use root group. It does not work. Um, whereas with dis the display IO split, the, the old way of doing it still does work. Um, it just also prints out a warning. Um, you can also set it to raise an exception. So if you see warnings and you actually want to figure out where they are, you can actually set them to do an error instead, which is really handy. Uh, I merged in 8.27 into main to get some fixes into main in 9.0. I also fixed NeoPixels in main, and that should also be out. And those are both in alpha 2, I think. Uh, and I did a couple cleanups after the 120 merge. Um, I'm picking up the split heap work, and we'll finish it this week, and it'll go out in the next alpha or two. Um, this The idea with this is that um, we always have a heap outside of the CircuitPython VM. And this is really useful for anything, any um, 
allocations that we need to do that will live longer uh, than the VM and will potentially be passed into um, other libraries like Protomatter as well. So it's, it's looking really good, but it is going to change um, the behavior of GC mem free. So be aware of that. And uh, it's possible that the, the projects that are on the cusp of running out of memory will, will work differently. So I'm really curious to get feedback about how well this is, this ends up working for folks. Uh, I, I was going into this work with the hope that we could remove the limitation on how many displays are required, but I think that I'm going to punt on that for now. Um, this work is really handy for things we know we need outside of the VM, but uh, displays and like I squared C and spy buses are used for displays, and it's it's not clear how to handle the case where like you may or may not need it after the VM. Um, so I'm just going to punt on that uh, in the in the short term, and and we'll iterate on the split heap stuff as 9.0 matures, and that's it for me. Great, thanks, Scott. And with mm. that was status updates. Uh, next up, we're going to go to In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for long-form discussions that come either come out of status updates or the folks have identified ahead of time. If you have any In the Weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things so we're not waiting around to see if anyone has topics. However, today there is a cornucopia of topics. Uh, so first, uh, we'll hear from Foamy Guy. And he writes, uh, would it be good to add circa PR slash issues circapython.org slash contributing page or perhaps piped in via the Discord bot like the core and a few other re repositories are? I think currently these don't show up anywhere outside of the standard GitHub notifications, which makes them a little easier to fall through the cracks. And Dan adds, I would like to add Circup and a few build tool repositories to the CircuitPython dev notifications. This is easy and I'll do it after the meeting if there's agreement. Works for me. Yep. I was going to say, sounds good to me as well. I forgot to unmute myself there for a minute. Thanks, Liz. No problem. All right, I will do it. Okay. Great. Like Circup and uh, maybe Adabot, and there's some other similar repos, CircuitPython build tools, that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Uh, next, I will read for DJ Devin. Uh, the new Qualia displays currently require the init sequence to be included in code.py, which is a departure from the way most displays work in CircuitPython. I'm assuming it's because there's no driver library yet. Will there be an RGB666 driver library with a display import in the future? I feel like maybe Melissa can speak to that. Or Scott. I think it's a good idea. Um... You know, the way that we've handled it is we usually do display initialization on a per chip basis. But in this case, it might be more relevant to do it on a per uh, display basis. I know that we have this, uh, we have this in um, the learn guide, but uh, yeah, I think it, it is probably wiser to just put it as a driver library. So yeah, I think it's a good idea. I don't know who's going to do it, but I think it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense where we can just kind of like say init the 2.0 inch one round display and uh, it could have all the init sequences built into the library. Like a Python library. Yeah, it kind of seems like it's, it's. do you think it, it's probably okay being one library and not one for each? Correct. Yeah, it's more of a convenience library, kind of like the right. um, the Featherwing library was. Yeah. Works for me. Melissa, are you willing to do that? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, next one is also from Foamy Guy. All right. Um, this one is for a uh, patch from, I started working on this a couple of weeks uh, back. There's a PR in Adabot for it. This patch was to fix the docs being able to build specifically inside of read the docs. Like they build locally fine, but they needed this um, tweak because they changed some of the way that their infrastructure worked. Um, 
it was approved, but I don't have access to merge it. I just wanted to check in and see if anybody else wanted to look at it um, before it could be merged and then see if there was any preference on the timing uh, to run it. <clears throat> and then uh, I noticed the other issues popping up over the weekend about the GitHub uh, actions cha changing their environment as well. Um, and I'm guessing that there will be uh, another change in the libraries to support that. So the next uh, thought that I had was, would we want to do both of those patches together and then just do one release afterwards that uh, has both of those changes? Or uh, do we want to just stick to like one thing at a time, change one release and then change the other and release? Uh, or is it the case that we don't actually need to change the libraries for that um, action steal? That could be as well. I'm not super positive on it. I think... Given that you mostly work on Mondays, I think Mondays are good days to do it. Yeah. Um, they're also good in the sense that like, the folks that work all week will be around to clean up anything that has a, an impact um, as well. So generally, like earlier in the week is better for, for doing stuff that might have consequences. Um, I don't think you need two releases, but I think you probably do want one just so that like your diffs are clean, kind of throw out, throw out for other changes, um, if that makes sense. Um, With both patches? Uh, so, like, do the patch that's in, and then once we make a patch for the version of Python, kind of apply those both, and then do the one release after? Yeah. Yeah, and if there's too much time between them, you can always just do two releases. That's fine, too. Um, okay. But there, there's often like a backlog of changes that turns into a release. So if those things are separated, patching versus releasing, I would gotcha. just do it in, in, this, in a single release. Okay, cool. I will, um, I'll poke around with the libraries a little bit. It sounds like it's just a matter of changing, um, inside action. So I'll work on like a draft PR and we can hash out anything there that needs to be different and then uh, get a patch spun up from that one as well. Thanks. All right. Uh, and next we have uh, Dan. So my, because of the troubles with bundles over the weekend, I it's still the case that the CircuitPython org bundle, which is not the community bundle, is missing a 9x bundle. And in fact, it hasn't had any libraries added to it since 2021. So I'm just wondering, I think the idea of this was that there would be libraries that were maintained by the hypothetical CircuitPython org organization, as opposed to being uh, maintained by individuals, by contributing individuals. But there are only like two or three libraries in there right now. So should we consider getting rid of this bundle or copying what's in it into the, into the community bundle? Uh, and if we don't do those things, does anybody just know how I can trigger a bundle release without forcing, I think I may have to make a, without forcing, like without updating one of the libraries that's already in the bundle. So, any any thoughts about this third bundle, which isn't even mentioned in a bunch of places? It's not mentioned, for instance, I think in CircuitPython.org. I mean, I like the theory of it. I think it might be as simple as actually just making a release on GitHub to get it to make a new one, right? So, like, usually Adabot will update, you know, check to see if any updates need to be applied, and then make a release. But the, I don't think there's any reason you couldn't just make another release, um, you know, following the same format, even though all the versions will be the same. But that will force the build and the release artifacts to be built, I think. OK, I thought it was the other way. I thought that there was something in Adabot that scanned all the libraries to see if they were changed and then did a release. Yeah, it does. It does do that. But I'm saying you could manually make another release and then all the artifacts get built based on that trigger. Oh, OK, OK. All right, I hope so. I'm not sure, but I'll see. I'll see. I think it may just put in the source code release, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it depends on what gets triggered. But 
also, I mean, people don't know about this 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 bundle, so that's what I'm talking about. I mean, is it supported in Circup? <laughs> I guess that's what. It would be. Yes, it is supported in Circup. Which are is people how using it that. through there? Yeah, it's like Circup. Circup was breaking because there was no 9x bundle. So when I fixed Circup, so it wouldn't break. But now right. every time you run it, it will now try to download it and complain that there is no such thing. Yeah. So, so that's why I want to you know, at least get a bundle and then maybe consider, do we really want this? I mean, it could be in the community bundle and it could just be that there are some libraries in there that are assigned as community supported as opposed to individual supported or something. I don't know. Yeah, or community bundle, but still live in circuitpython org, kind of keeps the delineation, but moves it into the uh, other bundle. Um, yeah. I was... I was just going to mention, I think a lot of the libraries in there originally were some display IO stuff, and there were a couple uh, of folks working in a larger team on some of them, but there are fewer these days. So it is, um, I, I would say I'm fine with them e either way, moving or staying, going to the community bundle or staying in that one. Um, and I will also offer up, if you do have trouble getting it to build, uh, I'm willing to poke around on that as well. So if you give it a try and it doesn't work. Um, and you want to have somebody else look into it, I'd be happy to do that. Sure, thank you. And I think it may be, it may be possible to make a build. I forget what it's called. Some kind of build action, manually triggered build actions. And we can add something to Adabot or something to do that. Right now, I've been like just rerunning existing jobs, which works some of the time. So you can, it looks like if you just made a manual release, it will, it will build everything. Great, and I will do. I will make a manual release and, and change the numbering scheme. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Just like I would just follow what you know the like date. The date thing. Right. 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 The you last. Could do, one. You could like do yesterday's date just to make sure. Yeah, I'll try that. Okay, yeah. I'll try that right now. All right. Yeah, it looks it looks like it's set up for GitHub Actions to come along and do the zipping and stuff for you after. Okay. All right, I'll try that. Thanks. All right. Thanks, folks. That was some good discussions. Uh, and with that, I'm going to wrap up. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, October 30th, 2023. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, where you can join by going to adafruit.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.